If you're looking for inspiration and challenge in the world of early years and Key Stage 1 education, then you've just found it. Welcome to the Early Excellence Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome along to episode 54 of the Early Excellence Podcast. In this week's episode, we interview Professor Nirmala Rao. Now, Professor Rao is a professor of child development and education at Hong Kong University. As part of our chat, we talk about Professor Rao's career so far. Also, we talk about some of the key research that she's led and also about an exciting international award for early years practice. So here you go. Here's my chat with Professor Nirmala Rao from Hong Kong University. I am delighted to be joined today by Nirmala Rao, uh, who is a professor, Professor Nirmala Rao at Hong Kong University. Nirmala, thank you ever so much for joining us on the Early Excellence podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to have you. Great to have you. So we're going to talk about a whole wide range of things, um, including lots of the research that you've been involved in. You've been involved in lots of research that has, have, has really impacted on practice globally, really, and it impacted on government policy and, and all sorts of different things around the world. We're going to talk about your research. We're going to be talking about, about your interest in child development and lots of different things. And we're also towards the end of the podcast interview, we're going to be talking about an award, an international award for early years that I know many of our listeners will be really interested in and will want to, to find out more about. So we're going to tell, tell people all about that as part of the interview. Now, Um, I was reading through your CV in preparation for the interview today, and what a CV. You know, that that is quite an impressive, well, very impressive CV. So, uh, Nirmala, let me just go through. So, you are are, um, Chair Professor of Child Development at Hong Kong University, Research Leader. You are, uh, in terms of awards... You are you've received awards for best of UNICEF research um, and humanities and social sciences pre- sciences prestigious fellowship um, and also an outstanding researcher award. Um, the list really goes on, and, and you know that, those are just sort of some of the real high points. So the list really, really did go on and on and on. Um, it is fantastic to meet you. Would you mind just telling telling us a little bit uh, about yourself? I was really interested to know. Um, at what point or when in your career did that real interest, that real passion in, in early child childhood development start? When did it start? It, it started when I was uh, in graduate school, when I was doing my postgraduate training. Actually, I'm trained as a applied psychologist, a developmental and educational psychologist. And I was doing my master's thesis in a preschool. And I was so fascinated by the individual differences in children and particularly what teachers were doing, how teachers were responding to children, you know, the interaction and how, you know, like a teacher would be so sensitive to some children who are a little bit shy and try to get them to be more sociable and how teachers you know, created a wonderful environment in the classroom. So I actually started out my career training educational psychologists to work in the school system in Hong Kong. And then I kind of moved from a psychology department to an education department because I really um, wanted to work in early education. So I think it was my my research that actually made me move into the field. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And and it is fascinating, isn't it? It's one of those areas, I think, and I'm sure you find this with your work, that in a way, the more you find out or the more you know about child development, in a way, that's never the end of the road. It leads to more questions. And the more interviews like this that, that I that I do with, with different, well, a range of different people, but, but quite a few academics as well and researchers, um, that actually, you know, each question leads to another question. I was interviewing um, a lecturer from York University recently around um, speech, language and communication in very young children. That was her area of expertise. And uh, I was asking her what her next project would be. And she was talking about how actually she was going to be involved in a research project around the physical development of basically of, of the developing mouth 
and and you know the muscles around the mouth uh-huh. for young children in terms of developing speech and it's fascinating because it then leads you into well how do children develop that muscle control how do they develop that and it leads you into another another area doesn't it you know every question Absolutely. leads to another question so Absolutely. yeah you know, it's it's an on it's ongoing work but always fascinating really interesting stuff Okay, um, so you're based at Hong Kong University, and you've undertaken a wide variety, as, as I've mentioned, a wide variety of different research studies as part of your work. Um, I noticed in in your CV, in the list of research projects that you've been involved in, that you'd done a longitudinal longitudinal study in China into early childhood development. Um, you were looking at early childhood development, I think, preschool quality, um, school readiness, early achievement. And it struck me that there are that there were links there between other other certainly other projects that I've been aware of. Um, so the EPSI project in the UK, for example, um, which, again, is a longitudinal study. And it, it just made me say it made me very interesting. It drew me in and I thought I must ask about that particular longitudinal study. I think people were really interested in it. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, sure. Uh, so in this study, we compared children who lived in urban areas versus those that live in rural areas. So in many middle income, low and middle income countries, there are quite a lot of disparities between urban and rural areas, as you can imagine, you know, Urban schools tend to attract different kinds of teachers. Like, say, you live in London, there are more museums, there are more parks than if you are in a very uh, rural area, right? So, but we did our study in China. So, what we did was we looked at, we worked in a very um, underdeveloped area and we worked in a developed metropolis. And we looked at preschool quality, child development, school readiness, and achievement over a three to four year period. And I mean, well, some things, you know, we would expect, like the children who were in the developed city, you know, uh, experienced, they had better achievement, better school readiness, they had better preschool quality, uh, they had more educated parents, they showed higher achievement. You know what we and so that is something we would expect. But what we're really interested in is the mechanisms and is schooling a great equalizer? You know, if all children are going into school, does it decrease these what we call equity gaps, right? And what we found, which was quite fascinating, is uh, notwithstanding what I've said, the the children in, who lived in Shanghai did better, but. Uh, parental education made much more, had much more of an impact. You know, we did very sophisticated statistics, but parental education had much more impact in the rural underdeveloped area. Well, this may be because the quality of schooling is not as high in the rural area and there's more variation in parental education. So basically, even though there's a national curriculum, you do get more experienced teachers wanting to work in the urban areas, there are more benefits. And that was really one of the the take-home messages that parent education really matters. Because, you know, in many countries, like say in the UK, whether you work in a rural area or an urban area, the government requires that the teachers have the same qualification, the PGCE or whatever. But this doesn't occur in low and middle income countries. You won't, you know, not all teachers are certified, right? And you're unlikely. To, so that that is one of the one of the findings. But of course, we found that uh, preschool quality mattered for child development, but some of the impact of quality uh, kind of faded away. And maybe it's the quality of the primary school that makes a difference too. So that was the main takeaway. You know, parent education makes a lot of difference in predicting child outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. It also made me think that as part of it, you'd included um, school readiness. Uh, And that I I would I would imagine that you spend some time there then defining what do we mean by school readiness yeah. and that, that that sometimes is quite a, an interesting area in itself yeah. isn't it they you know what skills do we look for on entry to school and what are we calling school readiness is, is interesting isn't it interesting stuff 
Yes, well, I guess we use the professional de uh, definition of school readiness, which is a combination of cognitive language, physical, socio emotional, and we developed a tool to measure that. So, you know, it's not just literacy and numeracy, it's like the holistic development of children. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's it's one of those things that in the UK, particularly, school, school readiness as a phrase often comes up. And then there's always a discussion, well, actually, what do we mean by school readiness? It's, it's always an interesting thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so um, your research, as I mentioned before, your research has influenced um, policy, government, government policy across the world, really. Um, so your research, for example, into um, effective early childhood programs. So that idea of actually what is effective in terms of in terms of our work as teachers and practitioners with young children. Um, I wondered if you could tell us about your research into, into effective early childhood programs, but also I wondered how whether you could tell us a bit about perhaps the kind of the maybe the differences of approaches across the world to give us that international feel really in terms of early childhood, um, early childhood practice across the world, which I think would be really interesting. Sure, sure. Uh Perhaps I can start by stepping back and saying that uh, we know that children benefit from uh, participating in organized learning that is like childcare or uh, preschools, right? But the thing is, children need to attend, right? So the first thing our research has done, because remember, we work internationally, is shown that there are lots of differences between children who attend preschool and children that don't in terms of their school readiness. So that's the, the first thing. And that's the one that has led to perhaps changes in policy, because if we can document that, you know, children who are um, attending do better than those who are not attending, that urban children are doing better than rural children, that girls are doing better than boys. And if we do this in a rigorous, proper way and show it to the government, they're, they're convinced, you know, that they need to scale up. So I think that is that is really important. And we need to look at this in the context of the world that, you know, uh, enrollment rates in pre-primary education, you know, so, so for three to five-year-olds or, you know, before the reception class, was 46% in 200, 2010, and it's up to 61% worldwide in 2020. So that, so that has been very important. So one is attendance. The next thing we know from our work all over the world is that quality really matters. It's all about quality. Right. Uh, regardless of I mean, we've done research in Cambodia, in India, in China, all over the world. We see that quality matters. Children that attend higher quality programs do better than children who attend lower quality programs. And this, you know, this is borne out all over the world. Right. Um, you know, even, you know, the UK research, the EPC, which you just mentioned. So so that that is the, the thing. It's not only attending, but you need to attend quality programs. So governments all over the world, they all want to improve quality, but they want to do it in the cheapest way possible. And the best way is through the teacher training. Is through teacher professional development, in service training, pre service training, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so that 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 that's the the thing about that. So, you know, that's what that's kind of research that Im improves policy. But then we you asked about the approaches, right? So the it's really important for countries to have a comprehensive early childhood curriculum framework, which is articulated, right? And it should be culturally appropriate, developmentally appropriate, play-based, child-centered. I mean, we know all this and it should be informed by how children develop and learn, right? Um, so this is really important. So what we see, if we look at curricula in different parts of the world, they all claim to be play-based and child-centered, uh, child but it's not always how it's implemented, right? Um Countries have standards, but if you look in some countries, there are 80 children in a class, you know. Um, so what we know in terms of approaches, curriculum tends to, if you look at the documents, the intended curriculum, it tends to be holistic, child-centered and play-based. But whether that actually occurs is the thing. Um, uh, the curriculum framework in is typically used to guide implementation of pedagogy. It's used to guide teacher training, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really um, 
important. So we do see different approaches. So even though, uh, you know, the curriculum documents may be similar, we do see more didactic practices. So you've got to realize that sometimes teachers work in very, very, very challenging conditions with low resources, large class sizes. So they really do want to deploy child-centered practices, but it might be um, an issue. So we do see different, um, you know, kind of approaches. Sometimes it's more like, uh, you know, primary school than what we think Child centered. Yeah. yeah, no, no, it's interesting. But also interested, interesting is, is that the, the most effective practice, as you said, as highlighted by studies like your own and, and also the EPSI study, have have those have that impact that isn't just seen at four, five years of age, even six years of age, but actually certainly in the EPSI study, you see an impact in terms of children's children's attributes so we call them those characteristics of effective learning we see them we see them well into secondary school in terms of the in terms of the EPSI study and and yeah which I think is fascinating when you think that actually because because you're absolutely right that governments don't necessarily want to put the money in in terms of say the the kind of those early stages you know that it's about sort of the the teacher training perhaps rather than actually the the practice within the space sometimes um and yet actually the impact of that high quality education within those spaces is crucial isn't it not just for a, a year two years three years but actually for lifelong learning. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the the work coming out of the States that is, you know, what the very famous Perry Preschool Project that has followed people till they were 40, they used a randomized control trial. They're finding impact of preschool attendance, uh, you know, on health, adult outcomes, whether you, you know, uh, have uh, good health, whether you hold a job, et cetera, and they're seeing it all the way to age 40. So you're absolutely right. And what what it is, it's not only in terms of educational outcomes, it's more in terms of what we socio-emotional outcomes, resilience, coping, you know, this is quite important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's the yeah, there's social, social skills and attributes that are crucial too, of course, for society. Yeah. OK, interesting stuff. Thank you ever so much. Um, um, the next thing I was going to ask you about, and many of our listeners uh, are, of course, classroom based. We, you know, most of our listeners will be either teachers or head teachers or practitioners. And and most of most of us are not involved in that world of research that you're involved in. And so I wondered whether you could kind of give us a bit of a window into how it how you go about your research. So can you tell us about the processes used as part of your research? You know, how is it that you, you know, what does that look like when you work with young children, when you when you engage with young children as part of your research, what does that look like? Um, and, and also that idea of, you mentioned it before, the holistic nature of, of early childhood. It strikes me that as part of research, that could make it quite complicated. I guess, you know, that, that, that actually young children's learning is is not kind of com- compartmentalized into very easy bits that you can say, oh, I can see this now very clearly. It's actually, you know, quite a quite a mixture, a holistic thing, isn't it? So it, it, it struck me that actually that makes it fascinating as part of research, but also makes it quite complex. And so I just wondered whether you wouldn't mind telling us a a little bit more about how you go about researching your children and child development. Okay, so we use multiple methods, obviously, you know, observation, interviews, child assessment, uh, questionnaires, obviously. So perhaps um, I can give you an example from one study, just a concrete example. Okay, so basically, our research sets out to influence government policy. And if you want to influence government policy, you got to do rigorous research, right? So, what we did this study where we had over 9,000 children in six different countries. So, we worked with the census department in the six different countries to get a nationally representative sample because the census department has the best sampling, you know, stratificator, right? And um, we did this uh, project in collaboration with UNICEF and we wanted to assess children, right? To show, like you said, holistically, 
But you know what the problem is, is we don't have validated measures and we don't have culturally appropriate measures. Right. We can't use the measures that are used in the UK because they're different values and they're different. Yeah. And so what we did is based on individual countries, um, you know, early learning standards, we developed a tool that had different dimensions, you know, cognition, language, physical, you know, um, cultural knowledge and participation, all the approaches to learning, which we think are important. And then we go and administer these uh, tests to different children in individual sessions. But of course, we can't just do that um, you, you can't just go in. You need to spend a lot of time understanding the context. You have to understand, you know, what is appropriate. What, what we're trying to do is see if a child has a skill, right? So in um, in UK, you may use blocks to see if children can sort into colors or, you you know, uh, by size. But in other con- contexts, we need to use, we, we tap the same skill of categorization, but we'll use items that are familiar to the child. Items, you know, they're conceptually equivalent, right? So that's how you, so you have to be very, very sensitive to the context uh, when you do these kind of research. And I think teachers are absolutely key because we always, you know, if you go to any country, uh, a primary one teacher can tell you a child who's been to preschool and a child who hasn't. And you ask them, how can you tell? Oh, they know how to stand in line. They know how to wait their turn. You know, it's actually the socio-emotional skills, the self-regulation the language. So this is why it's so important to use multiple methods. You need to get an understanding of the context and you need to understand what is valued in that context. Like some countries, the kids are really good in maths, but it's a function of the number system, right? Or exactly. So, So we have to be sensitive to these things. Yes, yeah, definitely. And I yeah, I would imagine quite quite large cultural differences in that perhaps in, in some countries and some cultures, children, it will become part of the culture that children use a particular resource. They might see somebody cooking, for example, a lot, and that they will be very familiar with with uh, with cooking in a particular way, and it becoming like being being a family in a family exercise, I suppose, and that you will see some of that come through in the children's play. Um, that's a no, that's a very random example, but you see what I mean. That kind of the cultural differences in that come through in children's play, I think, is quite fascinating, really. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, in other countries, we we perhaps you know we we provide for certain things generally as part of society. Um, we provide um, certain certain materials, certain toys for the children to play with at home. And the, of course, that will then have an impact as they go through into into absolutely. Into like, say, the kids from UK may be quite good at uh, putting together puzzles, whereas it might be totally inappropriate in another culture where the children haven't had that experience. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Very interesting. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, presumably the the work that you then do it. Um, it then informs you. Then take that to to a government or to an organisation yeah. and say, right, this is what we've found. So this is what actually needs to impact your curriculum. Oh, absolutely. Or getting children in school, uh, getting more teachers, you know, trained, etc. That yeah. policy, yeah, yeah, the policy. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Really, in, it's so interesting to talk to you. Um, it's, it's like a, a window into another world. It's it's uh, really really interesting to talk to you. Okay, so um, let's move on. Let's let's talk about this really exciting uh, award for early years teachers and practitioners. So it is the new international prize awarding um, $200,000 for early learning excellence. And really what we're, we're aiming to do, it's an international award, but we're aiming to encourage UK entrants as part of this. It's the it's the new Khalifa International Award for Early Learning. Um, it's a, a funded award. And um, we're looking for UK academics, 
We're looking for projects uh, involving, uh, involved within early years education, schools, nurseries, um, and um, those displaying brilliance and innovation in the early education sector. Um, do you want to, can you tell us a bit about the award? Uh, would that be all right? Yes, absolutely. We want, as you, you said it so well, we want to recognize outstanding research and practice. And really, the goal is to spread good and noteworthy practices in contextually appropriate ways. You know, uh, what happens is we we know that there are pockets of excellence <laughs> and we really want to spread, you know, cost effective, low resource or even, uh, you know, uh, other practices and that have demonstrated that they're effective and that they can go to scale. Yes. Yeah. Really interesting. Really interesting. And have you been involved within the with the award for some time or is this your first year that you've been involved? With this it? is my first year that I'm on the judging panel. Yes. I'm on I see. Year. I see. And on the judging panel, you're you're joined by uh, all sorts of people, aren't you? And I'm just looking at it yeah. now. Professor yeah. Iram Siraj. Um, of course, from Oxford University um, and, and uh, lots of other academics, um, really, from, from early childhood education across the globe, really. Um, I understand we've already got um, 40 prize registrations from the UK. So lots already uh, and probably more since uh, since this the, the, your press release was written. But actually, yeah, I, there is so much good practice here. You know, I know this from my work at Early Excellence. I go out to schools and settings. I work with early years teachers and practitioners all of the time um, and connect with them also on social media. And there, I have to tell you, there is so much. You probably are aware of this already. There's so such a lot of excellent practice here. Um, really, really creative practice, too. Um, you see so much that is fantastic and, and really inspirational. And... Uh, yeah, I'm sure people who are listening to this will be thinking, actually, do you know what? Why not? Why not have a go? There, as I mentioned before, there is um, there are, there's a lot of prize money attached to this. So um, it's in dollars, 50. Um, I'm right in thinking, let me see, two winners in each of the categories, which are best research and studies and best programs and teaching practices will receive $50,000 a piece. Yeah, so fifty thousand dollars. That's not to be sniffed at, is it? It's not bad at all. Okay. Um, now, in terms of timings, we need to get this bit right, don't we? Um, we need um, the the announcement in terms of winners. Uh, the recipients will be announced in terms of the prizes in June twenty twenty three, so June of this year. Um, and we uh, really, it's sort of this this month or so, isn't it? That that. Um, that there is a deadline within with I think it's sort of February, isn't it? That there's a deadline. Uh it's 28th of February 2023, end of February. Fantastic. Yes. So the end of February, and uh, and yeah, well worth getting involved with, I, I would say. Um, as I say, um a lot of money attached to it, lots of great way of celebrating effective early years practice, really inspirational early years practice and the projects that people are part of. A um, great way of celebrating that in the UK and across the world as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if you want to know more about that, and I'm sure you do, if you're listening and you're an early years teacher or you've been part of projects and inspirational practice and you think, yeah, why not? Why not? Let's let's have a go. Then what we will do on the with the podcast information, when the podcast goes out, this episode of the podcast, we will put with it all a link to all of the information that you will need so that you know how you can enter, you know how that you can send your details and information off to be part of the award. OK, all right. Um, is there anything else we need to add on that? Nirmala? Have we, have we covered? Please apply. Yeah. Please <laughs> apply. We'd love to see lots and lots of applications. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Nirmala, it has been fantastic to talk to you. Really, really interesting to talk to you about all of your work. You. So, so Thank many you. fascinating aspects to the research that you do in impacting on, on practice and policy, government policy around the world. It's so interesting to hear about that the different studies that you've been involved in and the research overall so so thank you so much for joining us on the podcast it has been it's been wonderful to have you here thank you so much for having me
And there you have it. Thank you very much to Professor Rao for joining us on the Early Excellence podcast this week. And also to you people for listening along as well. Um, Now, as mentioned earlier on, we'll put links to the information about the International Award for Early Learning, that award that I mentioned earlier that we were talking about with Professor Rao. We'll put links in the podcast information so that you can click on it and you can explore it further. Okay, definitely recommend it. It looks like a fantastic award. Okay, so have a great week, everybody, and we will see you next week. Mm -hmm.